Now, here's something about democratic socialism. They're trying to sell it now that if we vote for it, if we vote for tyranny, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the fascinating things is that 49% of the population is always going to be on the losing end in some way. And what democratic socialism does is it, it forces the population to turn over more of its tax dollars for services from the government, but also give up choice. You have to trade your liberty for a service, and only half the country is going to be happy with that. The other half isn't going to be. Well, there's a couple of points. Um, they complain about the top 1% in capitalism. There's also a top 1% in socialism, too. These are the people who are brother to the dictator, Maduro's family, whether or not you're in the army or the military in a dictatorship. They still have a top 1%. They're being fed well in Venezuela if you're in the top 1%, which means you're a crony of the dictator. Um, so it's the same thing. In capitalism, there's a top 1%, and a top 10%, and a top 50%, 50 but it's based at least for the most part, on merit, on how hard you work. Some of it's luck, but it's really whether or not someone buys your services or buys your products. With regard to how much uh, we spend on things, the Democratic Socialist, you know, AOC and Bernie, they say, well, all you have to do is tax the millionaires and billionaires. Although I think Bernie's dropped the millionaire part now that he's part mm -hmm. in that category. Everybody's rich. Yeah, now, now it's just the billionaires, I think. But uh, the math doesn't work out, and this is a big thing, and this is really the big lie they have. They say, we want to be like Scandinavia. We want the socialism of Scandinavia where everything's free, college, paid leave, all of this stuff. Everything's free, but the dirty little lie is that in Scandinavia, everybody pays high taxes, not just the rich. They don't top tax the top 1% over there. Everybody, starting with the poor, pays a 25% sales tax. You think people would rebel in America at a 25% national sales tax? Added on to the federal, state, and local Exactly. Taxes. One of the big things is also that when you pay the taxes, you give up your choice making. You look at public education, right? You pay your taxes, and you, you're assigned a building named after a dead president, and that's where your kids go unless you pick up and move. There is no shopping the marketplace. And what happens when we levy these taxes, they keep talking about the middle class, the Democrats, everything's for the middle class, but what you find is that the very rich people they can pay the taxes and send their kids to private school. They can pay the taxes and get supplemental insurance. They're not going to be affected by this new pricing system. It's people in the middle who are no longer going to have choices. They're going to trade their liberty and their, and their property for the government return, and you can't get a dollar of service for a dollar of taxes. So people in the so-called middle class are going to be stuck with whatever the government grants them. I think that's a good point, that the rich will be able to opt out of socialism and still find private avenues, but the regular folks who are so much of their income is taken in taxes, don't have a choice. But it is also, it brings us to sort of talking about ultimately capitalism versus socialism. Capitalism is freedom of choice. You know, that was Milton Friedman's book, Free to Choose. Socialism, the choices are done by an elite, by, by a Politburo, by a 1%. But that 1% is people who are loyal to the party and loyal to all the edicts of the party, and they rise up and they become cronies to the dictator. In capitalism, it's much more the power is diffused through the system. And there are people who rise, you know, a, a significant amount of people start at the bottom of the economic ladder in America and still rise to the top. And people at the top don't always stay there. And a lot of people don't realize this. Only 6% of people who made a million dollars last year will make a million dollars this year. People are going up and down the, the ladder all the time. The other thing they ignore about the top 1% it's just not the same people. It's different people all the time. Every month, the top 1%. Every generation, the top 1%. And uh, Bill Gates, who doesn't always get this right, had a good comment. He said, when you look at Fortune 500, or the top 500 or 400 richest people in the, in the country, there's nobody there that uh, you know, bought land in 1792 and mm. is still charging rent. There is some familial wealth in our country, and it is easier if your parents are richer. But I tell people there's never been a better time to be alive, whether you're white, black, or brown. This is the best time in the world. The poor in our country are richer than kings used to be, seriously, as far as the way you live with indoor plumbing, air conditioning, antibiotics, life expectancy of 80 years. I mean, really, the consumer uh, goods that you can buy with your income for the average person. And this is what AOC doesn't get at all. She's like, oh, there's no living wage. In the last 100 years, in 1919, if, or if you wanted one basket of goods of 42 different commodities that you would eat or consume, you can now, for the same amount of working hours, get seven baskets of those 42 goods. So really, the purchasing power of the individual wage, of the working wage, same amount of hours, is amazing at what you can actually consume now 
at, at still at a, a regular working wage. When we talk to young people, when we talk to people who are going to be voting for the first time, this generation has the most choice making in its life than any generation before it, yet they believe in people like the democratic socialists, but they don't behave like them. If you're taking an Uber to a party to go on a date with someone you met on, on an internet dating app, you're, you're, you're doing all these things in the, in the free market, and someone comes along and says, well, give all that up for a government service. For some reason, conservatives and libertarians are having a hard time letting these people know their behavior is the opposite of their beliefs. Well, they need to know where wealth came from. They also need to realize how wealthy they are. They don't realize how well we have it. And uh, humanprogress.org is a great website that Cato started. And they look at statistics with the same dollars. And in 1800, almost 90% of people lived in extreme poverty. That's less than $2 a day. Using constant dollars, when I was born in the 1960s, it was only about a third of the people lived in extreme poverty. So we went from 90% in 1800 to a third in 1960. Today, it's less than 10%. I mean, this marvelous uh, ability to trade with the world and buy products and the marvels of capitalism and trade have, have instead of 90% living in poverty, only 10%, less than 10% live in extreme poverty now. That comes from capitalism. When you look at people in government who really believe that they have the intellect and the ability to make decisions for 330 million or 40 million or wherever we're at right now, if you're a conservative or a libertarian, you look at that and you go, that, that is the essence of tyranny. You believe you know people better than they know themselves, and they shouldn't make choices with their own income. And I think that is the struggle that we are seeing right now that's going, that, that you know, as every one of the Democrats running for president, they all want some great new tax and spend scheme, whether it's universal pre-K, single payer, whatever it is, Medicare for all. But they ignore the fact that by doing that, they're taking away the right of the individual to chart their own course, make their own decisions, buy their own products. Socialism or big government or government control of things ultimately is the most arrogant and elitist uh, concept you can imagine. Because it is a very arrogant concept for me to think, I know what church would be best for you. I know what school would be best for you. And I think you're eating too many hamburgers and that you need more vegetables. All of those things are arrogant for me to presume that I know best for you. And it really is, when you think about, there's a, you know, some people talk about the humbleness of, of libertarianism. The humbleness is, I don't know what's best for you. I don't know what you should think. I don't know what you should eat. I could give you advice if I were a nutritionist or something, but it would be advice and persuasion. And this is what uh, is the real difference between those who believe in liberty and those who believe in coercion is they think they know what's best, and they're willing to send a guy with a truncheon and beat you over the head <laughs> if you don't listen. And the they say, oh, no. stop till morale improves. Yeah, and they say, oh, we're not willing to do that. We're just going to fine you. Well, what if I don't pay the fine? They'll put you in jail. Ultimately, it's the threat of state violence, but because they presume they're right. I don't presume I'm right or wrong. I will try to convince you of my ideas or convince you to buy my products or buy my services but I'm not going to presume that I'm going to send the government to make you do it. And the left does. So the left is about force.